Hello, everyone. How's it going? Let's try that again. Hello, everyone. How's it going? There we go. Thank you uh, for joining us at this uh, very exciting panel. We have some amazing speakers from uh, top tier TreadFi firms. Uh, let me introduce them very quickly. I have Toga Uzna, did I get that right? Absolutely. From Nectixis. Um, Mike McClone from Bloomberg Intelligence. Kevin Farrelly from Franklin Templeton. Derek Devins from Newberger Bergman. And Chuck Mounts from S&P Global. So what's even more exciting is talking about TreadFi or traditional finance coming into DeFi. Because we all know that for DeFi to get mass adoption, we need trusted financial institutions to bring customers in. And today, we're gonna talk about real life cases uh, to keep it real. And uh, without further ado, let's dive straight in. So I'm gonna start with Chuck because as with a title like Chief DeFi Officer, you're gonna get the first question. So you're the first Chief DeFi Officer I've ever met. What does one do as a Chief DeFi Officer? Tell us all about it. All right, uh, so, so thank you, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, so this is a, a team that was established at the firm about six months ago. At the highest level, uh, my role and my team is responsible for helping the organization redefine our products and services that um, in essence are fit for purpose for a future of decentralized markets. So that means adapting our existing products and services um, and creating a whole new generation of products and services. So as you know, we're the world's largest rating agency. We're also the world's largest index provider. Uh, but we have a variety of other businesses as well. And so what I'm really doing is working with stakeholders across the organization to adapt our product offering uh, to help, inv help investors or, or stakeholders navigate the challenges and opportunities in decentralized markets. Uh, Derek, we've been chatting about the product you have for uh, Newberger Bergman. So tell us all about it. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate um, the opportunity today. You know, I, I think some of the things we think about when we think about traditional finance going into DeFi, it's kind of everything, everywhere, all at once, kind of like the movie, that it confuses things. So from our vantage point, you know, we think some very fundamental things are going on in traditional finance, such as futures and options in, in CME, which are risk markets that have been around hundreds of years, trading commodities that you can trade Bitcoin and Ethereum. So those markets are really good at pricing volatility, and hence that can then translate into risk and management in the OTC markets and help scale for institutions. And I think when you think about DeFi, you have to think about it from where does it interface in the existing traditional finance or TradFi and where is it completely blowing up the ecosystem or completely in innovation was the word used earlier. And I think that, that that's confusing. That's what's going on in the markets right now with trying to understand FTX and what we need, what we don't need. Again, we didn't call it DeFi when you had high yield bonds and swaps and derivatives and futures markets. Like all that was innovation and now it's just happening so broadly across so many aspects that I think the panel will talk about. It, it, it's very hard to digest for any market or for any set of investors. So regulation, all those things will be very good coming. But we, we specialize in volatility and, and, and being able to monetize the volatility of Bitcoin specifically while everybody figures it out, basically, so. So Kevin, as the youngest guy on the panel, I guess you have the most credibility in this space. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you're doing at FT. Yeah, so what we're doing is very clear. Uh, I launched a venture capital fund for Franklin Templeton specifically focused on Web3 and blockchain. Um, over the past year, I've made 28 investments uh, into seed and, and Series A types investments. 40% of the fund is specifically focused on DeFi. I think the one thing you should know about me and the reason I started this fund is I joined Franklin because they acquired my company and that company was um, centered around using machine learning and artificial intelligence to mitigate default risk and various types of credit assets. And so I'm hyper passionate about bringing unsecured consumer lending on chain and, and allowing mass adoption, so allowing someone like Franklin Templeton to fund uh, loans that are originated on chain. And so I'm hyper focused on three areas. Uh, one is obviously ledgering real world assets on chain. 
Two is creating data, which is on-chain, which is in abundance. If you look at a company like Spectral, they're doing a tremendous job of that. And, and uh, lastly is identity, right? So identity is very important as you move into the world of under-collateralized lending and unsecured consumer lending on-chain. Private credit's the fastest growing asset class in the world, so why wouldn't I focus on that? Um, to me, it seems like a, a, a core match for my background, for Franklin, and a nice red carpet into DeFi, uh, which is why we're here today. So Toga, I learned that Nactisis has two trillion AUM. That's one of the new things I learned today. So with such a huge uh, AUM, what are you guys doing in DeFi? So I'm actually uh, the one person who, compared to Derek, Kevin, and Mike, I'm actually on the liability side of the story. I'm a liability acquirer who's been acquired by an asset manager. The asset manager is two trillion. Um, the, you know, Kevin is my role model. I've tried to be more credible by shaving and look younger. And, you and wear also, sneakers then. I didn't wear sneakers, <laughs> I'm still stuck. And also like Kevin, Natix actually acquired my reinsurance company, which is how I ended up there. The, uh, just to put the context of assets liabilities in perspective, the world's a hundred trillion dollar capital market, so those are assets like stocks, bonds, uh, real estate, commodities. Uh, so I, as you know, with every asset comes liabilities. About 50 trillion of that 100 trillion is the area that I focus on, which is life insurance and pensions. So uh, the company that I sold to Natixis reinsures those liabilities and then takes the premiums and invests it in assets. What we're doing is, again, very similar. Kevin's my role model. I'm saying that again. You know, we're smart contracting those liabilities. And we're also trying to put the identities of our policyholders into a central place. And then we're also trying to tokenize the policies so that they're easier to risk transfer. Insurance, the mathematics of insurance works if you can risk pool, if you allow the law of large numbers to work. And that only works if you can pool things together very quickly. Historically, that's been very difficult in the quadrant of traditional finance I'm talking about, that 50 trillion that's life insurance and pensions. It's very easy in property and casualty, so if any of you buy a car, it's probably being reinsured as you're on the website by clicking buttons. Whereas in life, it can be reinsured years later. It has to be built up as a block. And DeFi, the technology that comes with DeFi, especially smart contracting technology and being able to centralize the data on a chain allows that risk transfer and the law of large numbers to work much faster. So that's kind of the real world application of the TradFi world in which I work. So what's, where do you take it from there? Uh, the, uh, there's a problem in life insurance and pension risk transfer, especially in life insurance. Insurance companies, kind of like in Florida, insurance companies don't want to write catastrophe risk here anymore. There's a similar thing going on in life insurance. Insurance companies globally just don't want to write it anymore. There's some capital reasons for that, but technology is the number one reason. It's very, very difficult to issue an insurance policy. For life, takes three months. There's 15 to 20 different data sources. We were talking about this with um, uh, Mike earlier. The, uh, we, uh, you know, the, to defy life insurance, you have to centralize the data. It's kind of one of these paradoxes, and the data is extremely decentralized, which makes it very difficult to, to risk manage. And that's the direction we're going. Because it's selfishly, because I'm on the risk transfer side, I'm the guy who risk pooled. It would be better for me if life insurance could be risk pooled the way car insurance is risk pooled. So the, as people do their life insurance, if it could be risk transferred to me straight away as opposed to in large blocks, there would be more demand to underwrite life. You can bring back many insurance companies that have pulled out of writing life insurance, like many insurance companies have pulled out of writing Florida catastrophe. Uh, and life insurance pensions are one of the most important things in human societies. You know, solves a very important problem, financial insecurity in old age, as demographics move, etc. Uh, and uh, DeFi can have a very, DeFi is in the, the infrastructure around DeFi, especially the smart contracting and the distributed ledger technology that allows you to land identity in one place can make that much better. Finally, I'd say, one of the beautiful things that you can really achieve if you can really centralize all the data in one place, you can embed the supervision side by side with the policy. So supervising, regulating this industry of life 
industry of pensions is very, very difficult because the information is not centralized. Um, you can really increase the regulatory cadence, the regulatory frequency, the quality of the regulation, and that would be a good thing. Finally, you can really spread out the risk. Right now, guys like me have to take on an enormous amount of risk. We can't really distribute it efficiently because it's very difficult to share the data. That smart contracting DLT technology could really create huge efficiencies in that area that we are working on. That, so that's kind of our focus. Right? So I hope entrepreneurs in attendance are taking notes. There's a lot of tools yet to be built to fulfill that vision. InsureTech is probably the quadrant of venture capital investing that is the least that is attracting the least amount of capital. If you look at InsureTech, 85% of the money goes to PNC, about 10% of it goes to distribution. Less than 5% goes to life, even though it's 50 trillion of 100. And just to, what is 50 trillion? It's two and a half times the size of the US GDP, the Chinese GDP. And these are properly big numbers, receiving the smallest amount of venture capital investing in the FinTech universe. That's the hot tip of the day. So, Mike. The, the press always get the last word. Now, I know you've been a strong proponent of Bloomberg covering the sector. So um, share with us what you're seeing and what your latest thoughts are. So I'm um, a strategist. Um, so my job is sometimes to counter the press at Bloomberg. And I enjoy that role. They, if they put out a bullish comment on Bitcoin or crude oil, I might put out a bearish. And here's why. So the key thing I like to focus on originally try, is what Derek said, is that word innovation. I kind of get confused with DeFi, and I have to start with Bitcoin. And this year, it really struck me. Is I've never seen an asset as a commodity strategist that has no one's liability, no one's project like gold, but trades 24-7, is fluent, and everybody in the world can transact it with their phone. And this year, it really showed how it's been the world's leading indicator for everything, 24-7 fluent. So to me, that's classic, I guess you could call it innovation. TradFi, um, it's just never, that asset never existed. So what's trickled down from that? I mean, there's things called Strike now, where you can do remittances around the world with the Bitcoin in the middle, it helps alleviate the problems of you know, paying for uh, remittances. And then I look at things like a little story, I moved from Connecticut a year and a half ago, ex-Wall Street guy, and a good friend of mine, ex-Wall Street guy, just moved here working for MasterCard, head of crypto LATAM. That position did not exist two years ago. So here's a classic example of TradFi focusing a little bit more on DeFi. And what are they doing? Crypto dollars. So if you're MasterCard or Visa and you need to settle your balances, if you're lucky, you can do it four days a week because of holidays. Five days a week with TradFi banks, right? With the crypto dollar, and I've heard this from Visa and MasterCard, they can settle instantly, cost them nothing, right away, and they're done. It's just so much better. So what makes that happen? Tokenization. Tokenization is just picking up. Ethereum's the main platform to get there. And I ask myself, having been ex futures pit guy, poof, that business is gone. You've heard me say this before. Ex broker, poof, that business is going. Voice broker. How could you not adopt this technology? And that's why I see it from my standpoint. Commodity guy, Derek and I talked about this a little bit. Declining supply, increasing demand and adoption. And what's the risk? as um, Kevin and I talked about earlier, of not being somewhat involved in this is if you fall behind. So I, I use those two examples, TradFi firms, Visa and MasterCard adopting this DeFi layer to transact, because they know they're getting 3% in every transaction, right? Well, with crypto dollars and things like everybody in the world can get access to these things on their phones, that's pretty good competition. We better adopt, and I'll end with this. Everybody saw what happened with nickel this year in the uh, LME, um, the London Metal Exchange. It broke down. They are a centralized exchange. They had to break trades and stop trading for a week. Went up to like, I think it was $90,000, come back to $20,000. It did not work. And they looked over. If I'm at the exchange, I'm looking over at Bitcoin and thinking, wow, it never stops trading. No one's involved. We better adopt this technology or someone's going to tokenize our assets and take it away from us. So I've been reading a uh, new survey by Institutional Investor Magazine, uh, surveying 140 investors, uh, collectively managing 2.6 trillion. And 72% of the investors are still long-term uh, positive on the digital asset space. So going back to asset management, Derek, I'm curious if you're seeing demand from, is it, 
Is the demand coming from your investors, or are you identifying op opportunities in this space and then, you know, introducing it to them? Which way is it going, or both? You know, again, I think it's everything, everywhere, all at once. And and to build on what the the panel was kind of saying, you know, you're you're in a situation where when the web came out, right, the internet gave you Amazon, and you could order stuff online, and then Fidelity put up a website. No, oh my gosh, I can see my money, and I can trade my money but I don't really own any, I mean, you own your assets, and now in finance, like, the technology of blockchain is more like, okay, now there's, you can disintermediate every business. So I always think of it as, you gotta take somebody's money, right? Okay, the lawyers make a lot of money. Smart contracts could really do some damage in how much we spend for title insurance, life insurance, all of that. Um, I'm sure Kevin has examples of when you're thinking about settlements like crypto dollar. I mean, if you instantly settle, think about all the bridge loans and all the short-term lending and all the cross-border loans that happen. And if I'm just blanking on the word, it's not a loan, but when you need to change currency and you're paying for inventory that's coming over. Like if all that's settling instantaneously, time is money. Like it's all changing and it's, and you know, I use the term, everybody talks about crypto winter, but the glacier is getting enormous, right? And it's just gonna cut a huge fjord through finance. It's not gonna put things out of business. It's gonna settle on Bitcoin being, if you're not priced in Bitcoin, you don't exist. It's kind of my own personal view, right? You need the VIX of digital assets. You need certain benchmarks, and Bitcoin is gonna be that base layer or that one thing we all agree on. And then everything else can kind of flourish under regulation. So we, we're a very small risk base. We're just trying to pump capital into the risk side through the traditional channels of centrally cleared CME options and futures, but that's starved for capital, right? If you think of the lending side and private equity or private credit, there's also some creative ways to do it in very traditional means through CME and, and back to Tolga's point. Like it's ironic that you wanna kind of centralize things to then decentralize, right? So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's how we're thinking about it and how I think the evolution of, of, of the products and stuff go, but I'm sure others should add. Yeah, I, I think you did answer the question. I just want to evolve on your point on smart contracts. So, you know, a, a lot of times investors come to me and they want to know, is this an idea? Is this a vision or is this a real business? And I think data tells the truth. So I, one of the companies we invested in, I think they might be here, Arcade, uses smart contracts to ultimately enable loan settlement, right? And so one of the biggest risks, if I'm gonna lend something out, is am I gonna get the asset or the collateral back? And they use smart contracts to settle that dispute and they settle it very rapidly. I think from a legal perspective, we may say, well, does that hold you know, water? And, and maybe you can challenge it, maybe you can't, but the fun fact that I have for you all is this company has originated more loans in the doldrums of a bear market, dollar-wise, than a Web2 bellwether did uh, in 18 months. So they've, quadru they've tripled the origination volume. What took Lending Club, I think it was 18 months to do 21 million, which is publicly documented. Uh, this company, which is publicly documented, has done 34 million in a similar time frame. And so there's a network effect here to that time is money. And, and smart contracts are a very efficient way to settle a dispute or a default on a loan repayment or, or lack thereof. And I would just add that the, the important thing about a risk market being in derivatives and options is it prices risk really well. So if there's an institutional outlet, meaning futures and commodities and derivatives, to Kevin's point, default rates will get priced in. Right, so I understand, you know, you have kind of two layers. You have the idea of identity and security, and then you have the risk market layer too, that's like, well, as long as I, if I price the high yield bond correctly for some steel plant and it goes bankrupt, I get the plant property and equipment. Same can happen in digital assets. There's no reason that that little, okay, we, we have, can't get the assets back or our kid can't for whatever reason, just gets passed on to investors, and therein lies the opportunity. Chuck, please jump Yeah, in. I was gonna say, picking up on the theme that you guys were just talking about, one of the questions I get asked sometimes is, do I think of DeFi and what's happening as an evolution or a revolution? Uh, and you just used the word evolution a second ago, and I think, from my perspective, it's both. So in the near term, you have the evolution in market efficiency and enhancing efficacy in transactions. 
Uh, and you can see that through tokenization of funds like KKR or Hamilton Lane, tokenization of um, how smart contracts can increase the efficiency in market functioning. But the revolution part is still coming. And the revolution part is how does this DeFi ecosystem and this new set of financial intermediation rails um, change the patterns of credit formation and credit transmission? Um, and how do new pools of capital get created? And how do new borrowers access those pools of capital? That's the revolution. Um, and that hasn't really started in earnest yet, in my opinion. Um, there's going to be two drivers, really, uh, to, to facilitate that. One is the tokenization of everything and bringing real-world assets on chain in the form of tokenization and the birth of new tokenized assets that don't currently exist. Uh, and then the, the growth of the protocols that facilitate this new system of credit intermediation and the introduction of credit risk from a system that has been based on over-collateralization. So that's a maturation of the industry that is just beginning. And so you can see it with several of the protocols that now provide direct B2B lending uh, with little to no involvement of intermediaries. That's revolutionary. You can see it in MakerDAO's financing of uh, the Huntington Valley Bank's loan portfolio approved by the state regulator in Pennsylvania. That's a revolution. Um, and both of those instances are less than 12 months old or 12 months old. So. I think we're in a transition period from evolution to revolution, and as you get some regulatory and legislative parameters established, it's going to open the pathway for the trillions or hundreds of trillions of dollars uh, in TradFi to come into the DeFi ecosystem and all the financial engineering that's going to come along with that. That was, sorry, I have to respond to that if you don't mind. That was very well said, and we are at the early stages of that. So. People used to ask me, Kevin, where do you invest? And I said, well, where, where is their data? Because I need data to underwrite. And if there's not data, that I'm not going there. And so there's a company called Spectral, right? And, and Spectral's out there right now, and they're building the Spectral macro score. So they're currently today signing up users daily to build a, a reputation uh, and an identity via that digital wallet. And everything that is in that digital wallet can be publicly revealed or it can be held private. It'll be a user's choice, hence Web3. But if they want to publicly reveal it to a lender, they can. And the assets in that wallet, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe it's a, a dynamic NFT that represents a real asset and all the metadata associated with it, that can be used to build their on-chain reputation. But what's really interesting and radical about it is they're starting to see demand from legacy institutions that we all trust and know very well, like the largest credit, credit bureaus in the world, to get their hands on that data because it's not too dissimilar from things like Experian Boost, where if you wanted to boost your credit score, you would just hand over your rent bill or your telco bill or something that they couldn't collect. And so that revolution is coming because these new data sources are being created. The, the difference is you will have full control whether or not you want to share that data in the form of a token or not and potentially be compensated for sharing it. Yeah, and, and just one, I'll take one comment I would encourage everybody and for what it's worth. I think Bitcoin confused a lot of things. I think the evolution has been, oh, Bitcoin came out, let's try to improve it. Let's try to build upon that concept. And I think it's important to think commodity or base layer and then there's all the other things and it's not just trying to solve problems that we have with Bitcoin with energy or ESG or regulations that's it's really it simplifies things a lot I think when you separate that the two are evolving maybe to use the word revolutions and evolutions are very different things and I think it, it, investing gets a little simpler if you if you can isolate what your your target is Maybe just to connect the dots with something uh, Kevin said, if you could also take that spectral wallet or whatever it's called, and Oracle biometric data to it, income data, and then event data, you know, in insurance, you don't call death a death, you call a termination event. If you can Oracle those events into it, that wallet could also issue a life insurance policy in seconds, not three months. And the cost in, in that $50 trillion world, the friction from that three months is roughly 10%, so there's a $5 trillion friction in that world. 
that could, you know, it's never going to go to zero, but it could go to a, a fraction of that. If you could use that same wallet, and if the Oracle data was live, the risk transfer would be much faster. Again, I mean, going to something that Derek and I have been talking about, you know, you have to kind of centralize it first on a wallet to then decentralize the risk, but the, the wallet uh, is kind of the, the key, key uh, infrastructure enabler of that de decentralization. It, I, and just, just to end, it, it's, it's funny because as I listen to this and I listen to Kevin, it's very Orwellian. You're kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, I give you my rent bill. But capitalism has a very funny way of getting you to, in motivating the, the re, you know, retail and motivating investors and motivating the end consumer to do things that you might in retrospect be like, the centralization of data, but you're like, yeah, but then I don't have to go to the doctor, they have my medical records, I get instantaneous life insurance, like that's pretty convenient. And maybe it's a discount. So it's, it's very perverted, but it's, it's coming, I think. Well, I, I think that the statement you ended, con convenience trumps consumer privacy all day long. And it, people have a problem until they get what they want. And, and that's where it gets interesting. Well, just following off upon too, what you said, Chuck, former S&P person here is evolution versus revolution. I get the question a lot. Tokenization, what stops that of all assets? And then I'd look at the concept of immutable ledger and you think, okay, so you're the IRS. What's the biggest way to evade the IRS? It's called cash. So there's a bit of an incentive in what stops the process of going cashless? What stops this immutable ledger process for all entities? We able to track entities like FTX and say, okay, where are your assets? Through a, a ledger. I mean, to me, it's just a matter of time and I don't see what stops it. And that's, to me, it's the key thing is it's the revolution and it's that immutable ledger that um, you know, I look at as a macro standpoint is you just might as well be on board. So the clock in front of us ticked down to zero a couple minutes ago. I wish I could press a button and add 20 minutes to it. Uh, but I think uh, the panel has been able to demonstrate that there are now real life cases going on in DeFi, in the TreadFi world that are very exciting and the future looks even more promising. Uh, I think for all of you in the room that are building for that, you should be excited. The long term outlook is excellent. So please help me and put your hand together to thank the uh, panelists for sharing their wisdom and insight.